Hey, well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? So good to see you. I was just watching my number one man, Gabriel, right here. He's serving us right here with the whole, whoo. You ever see this guy doing this? That's Gabriel. Well, hey, my name is Julian, and I'm so glad to be with you this morning. I'm so glad you decided to make Neon Life Church your place of worship today. If you're visiting for the very first time and you're joining us on, online today, we just want to say thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule, your Sunday morning, and saying I'm going to be at Neon Life Church, whether you're visiting us online or you're right here in these seats. Thank you so much for making church a priority in your life. Amen. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, you ought to be glad you're sitting next to me. And then I want you to look at your second choice and go, uh, yeah, you too. Yeah, just, yeah, 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 you too. Yeah, look at your second choice. <laughs> I just kid you. Hey, again, as always, if you came and you said, man, I've been hearing about Neon Life Church and I've been hearing about the awesome pastor that's there. Well, our pastor's awesome. I just know that. Just ask Crystal. She'll tell you that, right, Crystal? Yeah, yeah, she was. She's down here like, don't talk to me like that, Julian, while you're on the stage because I get embarrassed. But, but he is awesome. And so if you came, I want you to come back next Sunday because when he tells you he's got a word for you, I promise you, he's going to bless you. Every, you know, he is, the, he is the shepherd of this house. And what we mean by that, that isn't something that it sounds so high and holy, but what it is is that it's something to be honored and respected. And so we honor that. We try to honor what God honors, because I believe that when you honor what God honors, God turns and he honors you. I want to let you let that sink in for a moment. And then, of course, there's guys like me who come along who are the, they say, the associate pastor. And so if you have a shepherd, every shepherd has to have a good sheepdog. You know what I say to that? Woof. Yeah, yeah. That's what I say. That's what I do. I am blessed to do that. I'm blessed to just be called to God and to be able to serve in the kingdom. And I'm, gl I'm glad to be ministering on a, on a, on a platform that, that somebody else has worked hard to develop. I get to come alongside and I get to water what God is doing. So this morning, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 9. I want to begin laying some groundwork there, if I could, in Zechariah chapter 9. And of course, it's going to come up on the screen as well for those who said, man, you know, I, I left the house and I, I didn't bring my Bible with me. But if you happen to have yours, whether you have them on your phone, whip that out and take a look at it. Because as we've always taught in, in years past is that somebody can just tell you anything that the Bible says, but if you see it for yourself, it's a game changer. But if you see it for yourself, there's no more argument between you and I that when you see God's word, whether you see it on a digital screen or you see it on, on paper like, like what I have here, you know, I, I still like my Bible. And, and I like readers, by the way. Can I say that? Can I say I like readers? They help me out. So, uh, beginning in verse 9, here's what the, the prophet Zechariah said about this time on Palm Sunday. He says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of, of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. Then I want you to turn with me, if you will, over to, to Matthew 21. Matthew chapter 21, and we see the realization of what the prophet Zechariah had said. So if you turn with me, I'll give you a moment to turn there in your Bibles. It's good to look into, the, look into the Word. It's good for you to see this. It's good for us to, together as a body of believers, because I'm speaking mainly to believers this morning, those who love Jesus. Does anybody in here love the Lord Jesus? Yes, amen, amen. He deserves all that. And so when you get there, just say, hey, I found it. Found it. Good, 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 good. Let me move along because I, I, I want to spend more of my time preaching uh, to you. But beginning in verse 1, the Bible says this in Matthew 21. Here's Matthew's account. It says, Now when they had drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two, two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt and their 
and, and they, put, they laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, if you're not tired of reading, I want to read just a little bit more, and then I want to get into the preaching. Is that okay? Amen. Okay, well, let's continue reading there in verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who, were, who had bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant and, and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you today. And God, we thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your blessings, Father, that you provide each one of us. Thank you that we have the opportunity and the freedom, Father, to read your word, to hear your word spoken, to gather together in a place like here at Neon Life Church and across our city. And God, I pray that every person's heart, every disciple of yours that is seated here, every man and woman, Father, as they hear the gospel, may it remind them May it stir their hearts. May it cause them, Lord, to follow you in a greater and deeper way. May everything that they have, Lord, be under your lordship, especially their lives, especially their children. Father, we thank you today for our time together, and we give you praise for this, and all God's children said a big amen. First thing I want to share with you this morning, I got four things I want to share with you real simple on this because first of all, I love the story of where Jesus goes into the church and starts knocking stuff over. It's, my, it's one of my favorite stories because, you know, Jesus is bad. That actually means good. But he's bad because a lot of people love the soft, beautiful Jesus. But because I believe that Jesus was the son of a carpenter, as the Bible tells us he was, I think when you shook hands with Jesus, that boy, when you shook hands with him, you felt something. You know, it's one thing about me as a guy, I don't like it when I shake hands with another guy and they do this. I, it just, hey man, totally turns me off. And it does, man, just like, whoa, whoa, I got to go find something else to do when they go. I've had that, i had guys like that, you know. Now, if you're the Hulk, then I appreciate that. Okay, but if you're not, you know, grab my hand and shake it. I believe that when you shook Jesus' hand, you were shaking a man's hand. They were rough and tough because, you know, they didn't have stuff like carpenters have today. You were meeting a man who had done hard labor. And the story I love more than anything is this story where he walks into the, into the, into the temple right after this grand entrance. And I could give you history, trust me, I could give you history about how the symbolism of the donkey it tells you that that is a person who's arriving in peace. He's not coming for war. He's not bringing a bunch of uh, battle armor with him. He came just as he was. And, and, and whenever a king would approach another king and he wanted to let that king know that he, he meant business as coming in peace, they would set that king on a donkey. It was symbolic to say, I'm arriving with no agenda other than peace. And Jesus came in that way. He wants you to know that I'm arriving to establish peace. It's also a fact that it was a little disappointing to a lot of people because all along people were waiting for Jesus. The people were waiting for Jesus to assume that he was going to take over an earthly kingdom. That he somehow was going to set them free from the, from the Romans. And the Romans, if there's any Romans in here, don't take it personal, okay? That was back then. 
So, you know, he's going to set them free and they somehow or another going to be these people that are now finally, yeah, Jesus set us free from the bondage of the Romans. And all along, Jesus was coming to set them free supernaturally. He was not interested, and that sounds hard when I say that. He was not interested about their physical condition as much as he was man's spiritual condition. He was most interested, and that's the thing that disappointed people about Jesus. I could also tell you that the same people who were saying, Hosanna in the highest, you know, oh, thank you, David, son of God, you know, da, 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 they could go on and on, were the same people who were standing days later saying, crucify him, crucify him, same crowd, same crowd. But today I want to tell you about how I love the Jesus because I read the story of Jesus walking in the temple in every gospel. And one of my favorite ones is the one where he goes over and he starts making a whip. Y'all just smile at me because I know it doesn't sound too holy. It doesn't sound very Christian-like. Nobody at Neon Life Church would do that. But you do it out in the parking lot. Is that okay for me to say that? But the one I love the most is where Jesus goes over when he walks into the temple and he sees people buying and selling these, these doves and interchanging money and making change so people could bring their offerings properly to the, to the temple. Jesus just walks over to the leather department is what I call it. He goes over to the leather department like, oh, yeah, I'm getting me to whip me some Hebrews here. You know, he just starts making a whip. See, people don't like to talk about that Jesus, you know, whipping Jesus. You ever heard of whipping Jesus? He's in the Bible. Yeah, Jesus did knock the tables over kind of Jesus. You know, you, you don't mind seeing that in a, in a bar scene in a movie, but to think about your Jesus going in and just knocking stuff over, just go, no, that can't be my Jesus. Oh, I got news for you. That was your Jesus. That's the kind of Jesus you want. If I went into the temple, I want to go into the temple with Jesus. That, that's very symbolic to the points I'm going to make to you today. How Jesus went into the temple and he began correcting things. He wasn't interested in fanfare as much as he was interested in setting things in order. So let me tell you the first thing I want to share with you is this, is the discipleship will always require fellowship. Discipleship will always require fellowship. You don't have to make an excuse for Jesus. Did you hear me? Hear me loud and clear when I say this, dear brothers, dear sisters. You never have to make a defense for Jesus because Jesus has already made a defense for himself. He hung on a cross for you and me. You're going to find that out more later as the story unfolds, not only this week, but also next week. But this week, I've been tasked with the responsibility of telling you that if you're going to follow Jesus, you need to remember, follow what Jesus asked you to do. It's not real hard. Jesus is real simple. He gave two disciples a simple task, and he told them, go into the city. You, as soon as you walk in their gate, look over to one side. You're going to see a donkey's there that's never been ridden. Not important, boys, that I know that. Just untie him and bring him to me. Simple rules. Simple rules. Easy steps. Okay, Jesus, from the top, one more time. I'm leaving you. I'm going there. I'm getting a donkey and I'm bringing it back to you. Jesus says, bingo. Yet for some reason, we have the hardest time. We, you and me, we have the hardest time as practicing that same simple principle in our everyday lives. You said, I did not come to church today for somebody to talk down to me. No, I'm talking right at you. Let me. There, there we are. I want you to know something, that it's important for you to not only say, I believe in Jesus, but it's more importantly for you to say, I'm going to follow Jesus. Because we have too many people in the American church today who love the idea of wearing the Jesus badge. I, I believe in Jesus. When you tell people you believe in Jesus, they automatically set up in their minds that you believe all these other things and you have a certain lifestyle. Does your lifestyle complement what you say you believe? Do you understand what I'm saying? Let me, let me give you an example of my past life so before I move on to my next point. And it's this, because as, as in every church, you know more about the pastors than the pastors know about you. Thank you. 
You, you really do. You know more about us than we know of you. All we see is that pretty cover coming through the door, that handsome cover coming through the door. But I'm going to tell you, when, when, I was a, when I was a young man, uh, man, I can say that. Man, it feels good. I can say that. When I was a young man, you whippersnapper. Anyway, uh, I still don't know what a whippersnapper is. If you ever catch one, bring it to me. Take a picture of it if you would. Anyway, back to the message. You know, when I was a young guy, when we used to, you know, I don't know if anybody in here liked classic rock. See, there's a couple of you go, well, yeah, me, but I'm a Jesus follower now, so I'll stick my hands back in my pocket. I want anybody to know that. But you know that whenever we did that, we'd go to a concert. We just didn't stand there like some people do in church during worship. No, man, it was rock and roll! That's what we would do. We would be jumping in there. We'd be hollering and screaming. Man, wasn't that awesome? What did you say? Wasn't that awesome? What did you say? And we didn't care what other people around us thought. You come into a time of worship, the King of Glory who just saved your life and changed your eternal destination. And you stand there and you go... When the, when the lovely Jessica and Caitlin and Brittany and Nicole were standing up here and they were leading you in worship. Some of us stand there because somebody told you it's not, you know, you don't want to be too wild while you're in church. Because somebody may think you're a fanatic. Or you're weird. Or that you actually love Jesus. Somebody might know that. Now, I like to think that all things are done decently in order, but there's a time for you to worship. There's a time for you to praise. And then there's a time for you to pay attention when the word is being preached. And then it helps out every now and then if you say, amen. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that basically was the same thing we did at the concert. Rock and roll! We said that because we're looking at the band who cannot see us, nor do they know this. But we're over here, yeah! That was a worldly way of saying, amen. We approve for those who are about to rock. <laughs> Discipleship will always require followership. When you say you believe something, let not only your words that you say you believe also be complemented by your actions. Thank you. Let me move on to my next point, and it's this. Janitor your own heart. Janitor your own heart. You say, what in the world does that mean, Jill? And I'm about to tell you if you just hang on tight. Janitor your own heart. Because I find it interesting that many times I've read the, the story of Jesus walking into the temple, and I find it interesting because I do not know what the time dispensation is between the time he rode in to the time he rode to, uh, pulled up to the front of the temple and parked his donkey. I do not know that. I wish I was that theologically deep, but I'm not. But it really doesn't matter. But I do know this, that I find it very interesting that Jesus, the first place he went to visit when he came into Jerusalem, was the church. And he went in there and he started cleaning up what he didn't like. So I began asking myself the last several weeks, what would Jesus do if he came into Julian's life? If he rode into Julian's heart, what would he find there that he's going to start knocking over, kicking down, running out? Because he wants to see something different in his place. And it doesn't match what Julian is saying. I find it interesting that he went into an earthly temple and he cleaned it out. That ought to tell you and me. Every day, Jesus, what's in me that you do not like, that you need to clean out? Come, Lord Jesus, and clean out anything that's in me that doesn't please you, so that way I can be pleasing to you. So what's the deal with the janitor? Well, if janitor is a word we get from the Latin word janus, J-A-N-U-S. It literally means arch. Or gate. And in historical times, the janitor was the person who had the keys to the gate of the city, and he would walk to the gate to make sure that the gate was properly locked at night. He was the janitor, he was the keeper of the gate. Sometimes you and I need to remember it's important that we keepers of our own gate of our hearts. We need to be the janitor of our own soul. 
We need to look into our own hearts and ask Jesus, what is there that doesn't please you, Lord? Because I want what's in me to be pleasing to you. And Jesus is not going to come and do it for you. He's going to ask you, you clean it up. You, ma'am, you, sir, you clean it up. In fact, Jesus is not even mad about it. Why? Because you're living in a time of grace where he just comes in. I believe this with all my heart. Through the gentleness of his Holy Spirit, he comes in and goes, that's got to go. Don't like that. Why is that still there? Why? Because he's so kind and loving. Your master Jesus is not like this one displayed here. Because right now you're living in this time of grace. And he looks at you and says, son, daughter, that has to go. Would you get rid of that? Because you don't want me to put my hands on it. Remember what I did back there in Matthew? I'll do it again if that's what it means, keeping you and saving you from the things of this world. If I have to do that, he will. You say, well, wait, 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 wait. I thought you said he was gentle and kind. There's a mad and furious love that Jesus has for you. And I mean furious. That's why he said, I'm a jealous God. It's not that he thinks that you're going to run off with somebody else or that after you've met him and experienced him that you're going to find somebody else more attractive. It's not earthly that way. Because he already knows the price he paid for you. And he's not going to waste that price. So he will hunt you down. Yeah, he will come after you. Yes, like the one who has lost the one that they love. They will come after them. Well, you love it in the movies, don't you? The movie's not as romantic if the guy's, the hero's the story's love attraction gets lost. And he goes, oh, well, there's more women in the village. <laughs> he doesn't do that. No matter where you go, I'll find you. You know, as they're pulling them apart, you know, in the room, y'all ladies go, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about, Joe. His shirt's halfway open. You see his pecs, you know, and all that. Don't, don't, okay, I know we're in church, but just walk, work with me here. You know, he's, you know, and he's pulling him away, and he's screaming, no matter where you go, I'll find you. Right, you love that, right? You know, you like it when, uh, when, when the guy says, you had me at hello. Right? He walks in the room. You complete me. <laughs> well, won't you go get complete and go wash the dishes in the kitchen while you're here complete me? <laughs> the kind of Jesus that I'm talking about, the lover of your soul, he steps in. And he doesn't like anything to come between you. That's what he's jealous about. Anything that he knows will hinder your ability to experience more of his grace and love. He refuses to sit, let it stand between you and him. Be the janitor of your own heart. Let me move on. Here's the next thing. Miracles happen when Jesus is allowed to rule. Miracles happen when Jesus is allowed to rule. Here's where we're going to get really personal because I'm talking to believers today. I'm talking to believers today right now. Uh, I'm talking to believers. And it's this. Miracles happened because did you notice that after Jesus got done cleaning the house, that it says that the blind and the lame came to him and he healed them. He didn't do it before, but remember, there was blind people already there. Nothing was happening good for them. They were in the house of God. Nothing was happening for them. Nothing was happening. But the minute Jesus came in and he began removing everything that was ungodly, even the disciples said, in one, in one gospel, they said, the zeal of his father's house has consumed him. That's a fancy way of saying, oh my gosh, he loves his father's house more than any one of us do. He is consumed with the idea that the house needs to be in order. But it was at that moment, it was at the moment that when Jesus was done driving out the money changers and those who were buying and selling that miracles begin to happen. So what are you telling me today, Julian? I'm so glad you asked that question. There are things that you've been praying for. There's things you've been hoping for. There's things you've been believing for with all your heart. And I'm not here to criticize whether or not you have enough faith. It, it annoys me when people say, just have more faith. 
And I all, all, the whole time I'm thinking when they tell me that, I'd like to punch you in the nose. That's none of you. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about you. Now you good Christians. I'm, I'm a little bit different. I still got a little bit of that. Okay, no, no, I don't. Oh, no. Thank you, Lord. Yes, I do. And it annoys me when somebody says, just have a little bit more faith. When in reality, guys, the Bible plainly tells us that you have all things pertaining to life and godliness. That God has given you all things pertaining to life and godliness. You've already been given the measure of faith. But it's important that you understand that sometimes there's things in life that you allow to stand in the way that miracles are not going to happen until those things get out of the way. That's hard to believe for some people. It's even hard for me to say to you because I love you in, in Christ. That sometimes stains are in the way. Say, like what, Julian? Maybe you have a greater love and affection for your money. Your possessions. Maybe you have a hard time telling that loved one, I'm going to start serving Jesus. I'm going to start serving Jesus. I'll be back after church, but I'm going to start serving Jesus. Some women may be in this church right now and say, well, Jill and I came because I came with a couple of friends and I just discovered that I am, I'm that person that needs to say yes to Jesus. I've been letting somebody else's influence on me keep me from saying yes to God and to serving God. Why do you say that for, Jill? And my mother-in-law, my number one fan is sitting right over there, my mother-in-law, she most awesomest mother-in-law in the whole wide world. Yeah, she is. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. She is. When I prayed for a mother-in-law, he sent me Pauline Valdez. Best mother-in-law in the whole world. I know you think that about yours, but that's okay. Mine's still the best. And my mother-in-law would go to church even when my father-in-law said, I don't know if I feel like going to church. She'd get up and she'd show up in church. Crystal week in and week out. Serve. Serve with all her heart. Didn't care if something else got in the way. Why? Because nothing was going to get in the way between her and Jesus. She was going to be an example. And through that example, through that example, my father-in-law is in heaven today. Because at one point, my father-in-law would say, what are you going to church for? You going again? Yeah, that little 4'8 woman right there. She says, yeah, I'm going again. I'm going again. I'm going everywhere. Why? Because I love Jesus. Men, if you're married to a godly woman who loves Jesus, you are so blessed. Because that woman will push you in times when you don't want to be pushed. And so finally, it gets me to my last point. It's this. Somebody will always criticize your sincerity. Because that's what they did to Jesus when the miracles were done. When the miracles were done, the religious people of all people showed up and said, don't you hear what they're saying? Don't you care what they're saying? Somebody's always going to criticize your sincerity. Can I tell you something? Be sincere anyway. Be sincere anyway. I'm not saying that for you to be sincere, you have to quote the Bible every time you open your mouth. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying being a sincere person. Be a person of integrity. Be a person of truth. Be a person of love. Or you can just simply say, well, I don't want to be criticized. Well, I got, I got some tips for you too. If you don't want to be criticized, here's what you do. Don't say nothing. Don't do nothing. Don't be nothing. If you never want anybody to criticize you, never step out in faith if you don't want somebody to criticize you because you're always going to have your critics, both spoken and unspoken. Somebody's always going to criticize you. Let them criticize you because when they criticize you, you're in good company. You're in line behind Abraham. You're in line behind Moses. You're behind, in line behind Ruth and behind Esther. Should I keep on going? There's plenty of them. They all got criticized. Moses, did you bring us out here to die? Is this what you brought us to, Moses? Somebody's always going to criticize you. And then more than anything, been the keeping of my sermon. 
They criticized Jesus after he had healed the blind and he healed the lame. It makes me laugh because I can't believe somebody would get upset because somebody else just got done well to them. Something good helped somebody else and you're mad about it? Wow. Wow. I need you to be sincere believers. No, let me just rephrase that. Jesus needs you to be sincere followers. Let your critics be your critics. And when you think about it, I want you to think about this. They criticize my Lord. So I shouldn't be surprised that they criticize me. I tell you that today on this Palm Sunday because Jesus just didn't ride into town just to be seen, to receive praises from men, to be recognized. Yes, it was important for him to fulfill prophecy because that's what he came to do. That was very, very important. But he came, more than anything, to make sure that his father's house was in order, to make sure that you had an example of what it means to keep his house in order, not just this physical place where we come to worship, but more importantly, that temple where his Holy Spirit abides right there inside of you. It's so important that you keep that in order on this Palm Sunday. Now, I want you to examine your heart. It's not you pointing the finger at this person or this side of the room pointing over to this side of the room. It's about you looking in the mirror, looking in your own heart and saying, Lord, what is in there that doesn't please you? Show me, Lord, that I might remove it. Show me, Father, so I might be pleasing to you. That one little area in my heart, that little closet or that hallway in my heart that I've always left the lights off, I didn't want to give it to you. I want to turn the light on now, Lord Jesus, and I want you to come down that hallway of my heart. I want you to point out the things so I can just start picking them up and carrying them, throwing them out the front door of my heart. Why? Because I want my heart to be in order and well-pleasing to you when you look to me, Lord. For a number of reasons. One, I'm your disciple. Two, I want to experience your goodness in my life. I don't want anything to hinder that. And then more than anything, I want to live this life that you've given me with joy, with peace in my heart, with contentment, with love for my fellow man. Once you bow your heads, I want to pray with you as I get ready to close. If you're here today and you say, Jillian, I'm none of those people. Uh, I'm not even a believer. Well, today you can become a believer. You can join the family of God. Really simple. It's really easy. It's not deep and profound. It doesn't require deep theology. All you got to just say, Jesus, save me today, Lord. I receive that salvation that you give to me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you would just give me another moment, just another moment. If that's you, just lift up your hand. I want to pray with you. I won't ask you to step out from where you're at. If you just lift your hand, just say, Julian, that's me. I need that salvation. I want Jesus to change the destination of my eternity. I don't want to play games anymore. I'm looking one last time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I love you today. I thank you today, God, for sending Jesus to save me, to redeem me, to pay the price for my sin, to show me that you're not looking for perfection. You're just simply looking for a yes from me, that you don't want me to miss this opportunity to turn away this free gift of grace, this free gift of forgiveness today. Lord Jesus, I received that forgiveness. I received that grace today. Thank you for making me brand new. Thank you for making me your son, your daughter today, Lord. I receive all that you have for me. In Jesus' name. And we all said, amen, amen. Once you stand up with me, I want to ask our prayer team to come down. If you need prayer for anything, we're going to just worship for another moment or two. And if you need prayer for anything, our prayer team is coming right now. They would love to pray with you and agree with you in prayer for whatever you have need of. Let's worship together, guys.